We welcome Dr. George Neild, the Associate Administrator of FAA's Office of Space Transportation. He has over three decades of experience in aerospace industry, including the Air Force, NASA, and industry. Today, he'll be talking to us about the keys of success. Please welcome Dr. George Neild. Thank you, Curtis, and good afternoon, everyone. Don't know how many of you are aware of it, but today marks the anniversary of a very significant milestone in aviation. 104 years ago today, on July 25th, 1909, Louis Blériot became the first person to fly an airplane across the English Channel. A French engineer and inventor, Blériot had earlier developed the first practical automobile headlight, which he supplied to Renault and other European car manufacturers. The business was very successful and made him a small fortune. It also provided him with the time and money to devote to his true interest, which was conducting aviation experiments. His first experiments involved ornithopters, which are aircraft that are intended to leave the ground by flapping their wings. Unfortunately, none of his designs succeeded. He went on to develop a series of different vehicles, including a float plane glider and the first successful monoplane. Crashes were rather common, but Blériot somehow escaped serious injury. In October of 1908, Alfred Harmsworth, an aviation enthusiast and owner of the Daily Mail newspaper, announced a 500-pound prize for the first person to accomplish a heavier-than-air aircraft flight across the English Channel before the end of the year. When the deadline passed without any serious attempts being made, the prize was doubled to 1,000 pounds, and the deadline extended until the end of 1909. Nevertheless, it was widely assumed that this was really just a publicity stunt to increase the paper's circulation. A Paris newspaper weighed in by noting that there was no chance of the prize being won. And Punch magazine decided to emphasize the point by offering a 10,000 pound prize for the first human flight to Mars. <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, that one has not yet been claimed. The Channel Prize, though, did succeed in attracting attention, at least in aviation circles. In addition to Blario, serious contenders included Hubert Lathan, an Englishman who was considered the favorite by those in the know, and Charles de Lambert, a Russian aristocrat who had been a student of Wilbur Wright. De Lambert set up a base camp near Calais but he suffered a major crash during a test flight and had to withdraw from the competition. Lathan made an attempt on July 19th, but he developed engine trouble about two-thirds of the way across the channel. As a consequence, he came down in the water and had to be rescued by a French destroyer. Although disappointed, he wasn't ready to give up. In fact, he immediately ordered a replacement aircraft from the factory and it was delivered on July 22nd. Meanwhile, Blerio and his mechanics had arrived in Calais, but strong winds prevented any attempts on July 23rd and 24th. But on the evening of the 24th, the wind started to drop. So Blerio woke early and put his wife on board the French destroyer Escapette, which had been assigned to escort him on his flight. After a quick test hop, Blériot took off at 4.41 a.m. for the attempted crossing. With no altimeter, no engine gauges, no compass, he was literally flying by the seat of his pants. He established his initial heading by lining up with the escapette, which was headed for Dover, but he quickly passed it. With the visibility deteri deteriorating, 
He was later quoted as saying, for more than 10 minutes, I was alone, isolated, lost in the middle of the immense sea, and I did not see anything on the horizon or a single ship. Finally, the coast came into view, and after circling a couple of times to lose altitude, he cut the power, and because of the gusty wind conditions, made a hard touchdown. Although his landing gear was damaged and one blade of the propeller was shattered, Blario was unhurt. He had been airborne for 36 minutes and 30 seconds. After making his way to the harbor to meet up with his wife, he was greeted by a large crowd who treated him as a celebrity. It's interesting to think about what space-related accomplishments might someday be considered as comparable to Blario's flight. Perhaps the first commercial space tourism flight? Possibly the first commercial test flight to orbit the Earth with a crew on board? Or maybe the first point-to-point -point space flight to cross the English Channel? As you know, the theme of the New Space Conference this year is preparing for exponential growth. Well, it seems to me that there are a number of basic prerequisites that need to be present before we can reasonably expect to see a healthy and rapidly growing commercial space industry. A robust market, demonstrated technology, and a regulatory framework. It certainly looks like the markets are there. NASA needs a way to take its astronauts to and from the International Space Station as soon as it is available. In the meantime, we are paying the Russians up to $71 million per seat to hitch rides on board Soyuz capsules. The suborbital segment looks even more promising. Last summer, the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation and Space Florida jointly sponsored a study of potential markets for suborbital reusable vehicles that was conducted by the TARI Group and was mentioned earlier. They identified eight different potential markets, including commercial human spaceflight, basic and applied research, aerospace technology test and demonstration, media and public relations, education, which we just talked about, satellite deployment, remote sensing, and point-to-point -point transportation. Now, the technology also seems to be in pretty good shape. After all, NASA has been successfully launching people into orbit for more than 50 years now. And this October, it will have been nine years since scaled composites demonstrated industry's ability to conduct suborbital human space flights by winning the $10 million Ansari X Prize. How about the regulatory environment? Well, from the FAA's perspective, we're ready to go. In fact, we're already in discussion with about a half dozen companies, each of which is in the process of designing, building, and testing vehicles that will be capable of taking people up to the edge of space where they will be able to look out the window and see the black sky and the curvature of the Earth and experience the magic of weightlessness. As directed by the Commercial Space Launch Amendments Act of 2004, Spaceflight participants will be flying under an informed consent regime under which they will need to be thoroughly briefed on all of the risks that they will encounter, on all the things that could go wrong, that they could be seriously injured or even killed during the flight. And if, after having heard all of that, they still want to go, they'll be asked to sign some paperwork saying that they understand and accept the risks at which point they'll be told to have a good flight. The FAA already has regulations on the books to ensure the safety of the uninvolved public, plus some top-level human spaceflight requirements dealing with crew, mem crew member qualifications, environmental and life support systems, smoke and fire detection, and training for emergencies. And we're prepared to make determinations on launch licenses for human spaceflight missions whenever industry is ready to submit them. 
It's interesting to note that the maturity of our regulatory environment is one area where the United States is clearly leading the way in the international community. In fact, we've been approached by several foreign launch operators who are planning to do at least their initial test flights in the U.S. because their governments have not yet decided how commercial suborbital space flight should be regulated. Specifically, other countries may consider vehicles with wings to be aircraft, which could require that they be certified by aviation authorities, a process that could take a long time and be very expensive. So here in the U.S., we've got markets, we've got demonstrated technologies, and we've got a regulatory framework. Is that all that we need in order to experience exponential growth in commercial space? Well, I, I think a case can be made that those are the basic requirements. But as I reflect upon what enabled Blario to make a difference in aviation, there may be a few additional keys to success that need to be in place to push us off of dead center and keep us moving forward rapidly. First, we need to encourage a spirit of innovation. Blario was constantly trying out new ideas in order to find a better design approach. It took him several iterations before he settled on the monoplane configuration that he used to fly the channel. Bert Rattan and his team at Scaled Composites clearly exhibited that kind of spirit when they came up with the design for Spaceship One. Who would have guessed that you could build a spacecraft powered by laughing gas and rubber? Or that by folding a vehicle in half during the flight to form a shuttlecock shape, you could dramatically cut down on reentry heating? If we want to significantly improve the safety and decrease the cost of traveling to space, we need to be open to new designs and new ways of doing business. Second, if we want to make progress, we need to be willing to accept reasonable levels of risk. With all the accidents he experienced, Blario seemed to be a believer in the philosophy of build, test, crash, repeat. <laughs> Although he was very fortunate in that he usually walked away from his mishaps on one particularly gusty day, he crashed the airplane he was flying into the top of a house, breaking several ribs and suffering internal injuries, resulting in a three-week hospitalization. Amazingly, that incident does not seem to have affected his enthusiasm going forward. In terms of spaceflight, Congress has noted that space transportation is inherently risky. NASA with all of its expertise, experience, and emphasis on safety, experienced two fatal accidents out of 135 space shuttle missions. Going forward, I'd like to think that the nation can do better. But the only way to completely avoid accidents would be not to launch at all. Finally, we need to cultivate a sense of urgency whether that comes from trying to win a prize, beating out competitors in the marketplace, or being motivated by a general passion for progress. Having people who are dedicated to completing the mission as quickly as possible can really make a difference. Three years after their historic flight in 1903, the Wright brothers were granted a patent for new and useful improvements in flying machines. But at that point, they became preoccupied with legal battles, which ended up impacting their work on new designs. As a result, they didn't conduct any flights at all in 1906 and 1907. <coughs> By 1911, the Wright's aircraft were no longer competitive with the designs coming out of Europe. When World War I began, no acceptable U.S. designs were available. 
resulting in the U.S. military having to use French aircraft during aerial combat. Think about that. Hopefully, we are not seeing a similar scenario unfold with respect to human spaceflight. But we need to recognize that our nation's great achievements in space do not guarantee future success. After decades of international leadership and two years after completion of the final space shuttle mission, the United States no longer has the capability to launch astronauts into space from American soil. That's why NASA's commercial crew program is so important. With the appropriate funding from Congress, it will permit the development of safe, reliable, and cost-effective transportation for our astronauts to use in traveling to and from the International Space Station. And once the vehicles are operational, they can be used for a wide variety of other customers and markets. <coughs> there are a couple of other steps that we can take to assist the space industry in moving forward. In 2010, 2011, and 2012, the FAA was able to award a number of spaceport grants to support the planning and infrastructure needs of our nation's spaceports. Although for budgetary reasons we were not able to make any awards this year, this is a program that could make a significant difference if funding is available in the future. I'd also like to see us continue with support for our Center of Excellence for Commercial Space Transportation. The center is a public-private partnership between government, industry, and academia that is designed to allow students and professors from around the country to do research on topics that are of interest to the aerospace community. Prior to sequestration, the FAA had committed to providing $1 million per year for this program, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to maintain at least that level of funding in the future. We've also invited NASA and the DOD to join in if they're interested. The nice thing is every dollar from the federal government is required to be matched dollar for dollar by the schools or by industry. So it turns out to be a great deal for the taxpayer. There are currently nine different member universities, including Stanford, just up the road from here. But we have recently created an affiliate membership category which will allow additional colleges and universities and other entities to participate in center activities. Although the affiliate members will not be receiving federal funding, they will have access to our research and development strategic planning and technology road mapping efforts, and they will have an opportunity to collaborate with us in finding solutions to a number of real-world, high-priority challenges related to commercial space. If you're interested in finding out more about the affiliate membership program, please try and catch me during one of the breaks here at the conference or send me an email and we'll get you some additional information. This is an exciting time for commercial space transportation. It seems like every month we are seeing new vehicles start their flight tests, new systems being assembled, or new business plans being announced. And the pace is definitely accelerating. As just one example of that, last year in FY 2012, there were a grand total of three FAA licensed or permitted launches. So far this year, with a couple of months left to go in FY 2013, we have already had 14 licensed or permitted launches. That's more than a four-fold increase. And going forward, given the number of applications that we've been receiving in the last few months, it's only going to get busier. Are we prepared for exponential growth? Well, we've got the basic prerequisites of robust markets, demonstrated technologies, and a regulatory framework already in place. And the potential is there to add those three special ingredients, a spirit of innovation, a willingness to accept reasonable levels of risk, and a sense of urgency. With those keys to success in hand, I am confident that we'll be seeing exponential growth before you know it. Thank you very much.
Yes? Microphone's coming. Hi, George. Paul Masson from Strategic Alliance's question. Does the FAA have a charter to set the technology standards for either the vehicles or the in-space operating systems? So l let me r remind everyone that currently the FAA only has regulatory authority over launches and reentries because the assumption was that's where the uninvolved public would be affected, right? No government agency today has regulatory authority for on-orbit activities. NASA does them, but they don't regulate. In terms of how we do the regulations, we, we have requirements in terms of how to ensure that the public does not uh, suffer from any catastrophic events during the flight. Now, there's a number of ways you can do that. One is by having a, a flight termination or flight safety system. Another would be to use the, the aviation model, which involves a certification of the vehicle. We are not certifying systems, subsystems, vehicles today. I think that's probably where we'll end up, but that'll be quite a number of years down the road. Okay, other questions? Hello. Okay. Um, my name is Ioana Kozmuza, and I um, support the Space Portal at NASA Ames Research Center. I have a question um, regarding your um, comment about the regulatory um, role, especially for reentry systems. Um, and if you have, if you can comment about, especially about the um, hypersonic portion of reentry. Um, this is one area where I've, I've been extremely curious, and um, actually I led the first Gordon Research Conference on Atmospheric Reentry Physics uh, back in February. Um, to my knowledge, no, none of the vehicles uh, have any kind of safety feature or evacuation feature during their reentry. So is that something that FAA is looking into? Um, yeah, for So for very, crew. very for challenging crew. technology, obviously. Uh, Again, we, we do have requirements in terms of how the reentries need to be conducted, and frankly, that comes down to primarily ensuring that you come down in the right place. So the first time that the FAA had ever granted a reentry license was for the Dragon capsule that SpaceX has used on their last several missions. So that was a first for us. It was a first for private industry, and we had to look at a lot of things. What if the rocket burn is too short, what if it's too long? Is there a possibility that you could end up coming down in Los Angeles or over some other populated area? So those are definitely things to, to look at. Again, we don't have requirements on the materials or the thickness of the heat shield or things like that, but we look at the hazards, what's the probability that someone could be impacted and what is the way to mitigate those risks? Yes, sir. Hi, George, uh, Rob Kelso, Space Center, Hawaii. What do you see would be required in the next step in, instead of just doing a ballistic up and down to do a short range point to point, like one island in Hawaii to another island in Hawaii as a, as a part of growing that uh, range? What, what regulatory things would be added on for that out of the FAA, if any? Frankly, I think that one's less regulatory challenges and more technology challenges. Uh, interestingly, it seems to me that the point-to-point -point transportation through space is just a lot harder than you'd think it would be. And, and heating is a key element of that. If you look at the, the systems that are flying today, like the Spaceship One, the Spaceship Two, that model, they have a pretty short range if you wanted to fly them down range instead of just straight up and straight down. So there is a limited capability there. But I think, frankly, what's going to happen is we're going to learn from the up and down, land at the same place where you take off, when these suborbital vehicle operations start, which I believe will be in the next 12 months. And then we'll start learning from that. And then the question will be, so what would we have to change to be able to significantly increase the, 
the range capability of these systems. And then flying from Hawaii or flying from Mojave to Spaceport America, New Mexico, those types of hops I think will come next. And then as we learn from that such that people feel confident that you don't have to be unnecessarily concerned over overflying populated areas, then we'll have the ability to look at longer range. And of course, that is the holy grail of a lot of these systems is, is to say, is there a way to fly to the other side of the world fast? There's a huge market for that, but it's pretty hard. The amount of energy you need to do that is almost as much as it takes to actually go into orbit. So we know that's coming, but it's a little ways downstream. Okay, I think we have time for one or two more. Hi, Zach Stewart, software developer at Big Nerd Ranch. Um, you mentioned the uh, early decline of the aviation industry in the States, um, where the Wright brothers lost their edge and thus the United States aviation industry did, more surpassed by Europe. Um, we kind of see this pattern a lot in technology in the States where we invent and innovate something and then we get passed up. Take the internet, for example. Um, what do you think is the biggest risk of that happening in the space industry and how can we mitigate it? Great question. Uh, we've heard several of the speakers so far today talk about the importance of talking to and thinking like a customer. Uh, yes, we need to have investment, but it's more than just, gosh, can we get a government grant or can, can we get NASA to do that? If you want to have a sustainable commercial activity, you need to have a big class of potential customers out there lining up. And so I think one of the best things that we can do is to think from the start about who are the customers or potential customers and start now educating them, tantalizing them, holding out this promise, this vision, so that when we do get the technology to work, then you'll have people lining up. Now, I, frankly, I think we're seeing that to some extent on the the space tourism side, the, the media and the advertising that Richard Branson has done with Virgin Galactic, the fact that they've, they've got 600 people who have put down deposits and we haven't even got a vehicle ready to go yet. They've collected $60 million sitting there waiting for operations to begin. That's, that's a good start. Uh, XCOR has likewise signed up a bunch of potential customers. So I, I think that's one of the key to get us from there. We've demonstrated, we've proved it can be done. Let's go into business. Where's the infrastructure? Where's the advertising? Where's the travel agents? Where's the commercials that we're going to need? Uh, if you s want to be successful long term, I think you need to start thinking about those things right up front. OK, one more. Hi, Dr. Neal. I'm Liz Kennick from Teachers in Space, which is the project of the Space Frontier Foundation. And one of the things that we've begun doing is flying experiments right now to International Space Station. We're looking forward to flying experiments suborbitally. Yes. And I wonder what the FAA regulations might be around that. How will you monitor what's being flown? How will you handle approval of experimental flights and payloads? We think we're in, in good shape today to be able to account for that. Part of the launch license process is to identify the payloads that will be flown, but we're perfectly willing to look at categories of things. It doesn't have to be, here's the model number of what you got, but basically you're looking at, are there any things that could cause a safety hazard if there were to be an accident of some sort? So I think we're prepared now to do that. We need the vehicles. We've got some potential customers for educational, for space tourism, for research and technology, and we're looking forward to uh, that starting so that we can have a more routine pace of operations. Great. Well, thank you very much.